Hey, morning, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so last week you heard about uh, logistic regression and um, uh, generalized linear models. And it turns out all of the learning algorithms we've been learning about so far are called discriminative learning algorithms, which is one big bucket of learning algorithms. And today, um, what I'd like to do is share with you how generative learning algorithms work. Um, in particular, you learn about Gaussian discriminant analysis, so by the end of the day, you know how to implement this. And it turns out that uh, compared to, say, logistic regression for classification, GDA is actually a um, simpler and maybe more computationally efficient algorithm to implement uh, in some cases. So, um, and it sometimes works better if you have uh, very small data sets, sometimes, with some caveats. Um, and we'll talk about comparison between Generative learning algorithms, which is a new class of algorithms you hear about today, versus discriminative learning algorithms. And then we'll talk about naive Bayes and how you could use that to uh, build a span filter, for example. Okay. So um, we'll use binary classification as the motivating example for today. And um, if you have a data set that looks like this with two classes, then what a discriminative learning algorithm like logistic regression would do is use gradient descent to search for a line that separates the positive and negative examples, right? So if you randomly initialize parameters, maybe it starts with some uh, division boundary like that, and over the course of gradient descent, you know, the line migrates or evolves until you get maybe a line like that that separates the positive and negative examples. And, um, uh, logistic regression is really searching for a line, searching for a decision boundary that separates the positive and negative examples. Um, and so if this was the uh, malignant tumors and the benign tumors example, right, uh, that's, that's what logistic regression would do. Now, there's a different class of algorithm which isn't searching for this separation, which isn't trying to maximize the likelihood that you, the way you saw last week, which is, um, Here's an alternative, it's just called a generative learning algorithm, which is rather than looking at two classes and trying to find a separation, instead the algorithm is going to look at the classes one at a time. First, we'll look at all of the malignant tumors, right, in the cancer example, and try to build a model for what malignant tumors look like. So you might say, oh, it looks like all the malignant tumors, um, roughly, all the malignant tumors roughly live in that ellipse. And then you look at all the benign tumors in isolation and say, oh, it looks like all the benign tumors roughly live in that ellipse. And then at classification time, if there's a new you know, patient in your office with those features, uh, it would then look at this new patient and compare it to the malignant tumor model, compare it to the benign tumor model, and then say, in this case, oh, it looks like this one looks a lot more like the benign tumors I had previously seen, so I'm gonna classify that as a benign tumor. Okay. So um, rather than uh, looking at both classes simultaneously and searching for a way to separate them, a generative learning algorithm uh, instead builds a model of what each of the classes looks like, kind of almost in isolation, you know, what, what some details we'll learn about later. And then at test time, uh, it evaluates a new example against the benign model, evaluates against the malignant model, and tries to see which of the two models it matches more closely against. So let's formalize this. Um, a discriminative learning algorithm learns p of y given x, right? Um, or, uh, or, or it learns um, right, some mapping <coughs> from x to y directly. You know, the learn, or, or it can learn, I think uh, Arnon briefly talked about the perceptual algorithm. We'll talk about support vector machines later. Um, it learns a function mapping from x to the labels directly. So that's a discriminative learning algorithm where you're trying to discriminate between positive and negative classes. In contrast, a generative learning algorithm it learns p of um, x given y. So this says 
what are the features like, given the class, right? So um, instead of p of y given x, we're going to learn p of x given y. So in other words, given that the tumor is malignant, what are the features likely going to be like? Or given the tumor is benign, what are the features x going to be like? Okay. Um, and then as, and then it'll also, generative learning algorithm will also learn p of y. So this is a, this is also called the class prior. Excuse me, this probability, I guess. Right, it's called a class prior. It's just when a patient walks into your office, before you've even examined them, before you've even seen them, what are the odds that their tumor is malignant versus benign, right, before you've seen any features, okay? And so, using Bayes' rule, if you can build a model for P of X given Y and for P of Y, um, if, you know, if you can calculate numbers for both of these quantities, then using Bayes' rule, when you have a new test example with features x, you can then calculate the chance of y being equal to 1 as this right, uh, where p of x by the And so if you learn this term, p of x given y, then you can plug that in here. Right. And if you've also learned this term, p of y, you can plug that in here. Right. Um, so oh, and p of x in the denominator goes in the denominator. Okay, so if you've learned both both of those terms in the red square and in the orange square, you could plug it into all of those terms and therefore use uh, Bayes' rule to calculate p of y equals 1 given x. So given a new patient with features x, you could use this formula to calculate what's the chance that the tumor is malignant if you've estimated you know, these, these two quantities in the red and in the orange circles. Okay? So, um, that's the framework we'll use to build generative learning algorithms. And in fact, today you see two examples of generative learning algorithms. Uh, one for continuous value features, uh, which is used for things like the tumor classification, and one for uh, discrete features, which uh, you can use for building like an email spam filter, right? Or, or I don't know, or if you want to download Twitter things and see how positive or negative the sentiment on Twitter is or something, right? So, you, so we'll have a natural language processing example later. So um, let's talk about Gaussian discriminant analysis. Um, so uh, let's develop this model assuming that the features x are continuous valued and. When we develop um, generative learning algorithms, I'm going to use x and rn. So, you know, I'm going to drop the x0 equals 1 convention. Right? So I'm not going to, I'm, we're not going to need that extra x0 equals 1. So x is now rn rather than rn plus 1. And the key assumption in Gaussian discriminant analysis is we're going to assume that p of x given y is distributed Gaussian, right? In other words, condition on the tumor as being malignant, the distribution of the features is Gaussian. You know, the features like the size of the, the, size of the tumor, the, the cell adhesion, the whatever features you use to measure a tumor. Um, and condition on it being benign, the distribution is also Gaussian. So, um, actually, how many of you are familiar with a multivariate Gaussian? Raise your hand if you are. Like half of you, one third, no, two fifths? Okay, cool. All right. Oh, how many of you are familiar with a univariate, like a single dimensional Gaussian? Okay, cool. Almost everyone. 
All right, cool. So let me, let me just go through what is a multivariate Gaussian distribution. So the Gaussian is this familiar bell-shaped curve. A multivariate Gaussian is the generalization of this familiar bell-shaped curve over one-dimensional random variable to multiple random variables at the same time, to, to, to vector value random variables rather than univariate random variable. So um, if Z is distributed Gaussian with some mean vector mu and some covariance matrix sigma. Um, so if z is uh, in Rn, then mu would be Rn as well, and sigma, the covariance matrix, would be n by n. So if z is two-dimensional, mu is two-dimensional, and sigma is two-dimensional. And the expected value of z is equal to um, the mean, and the um, covariance of z well, if you're familiar with multivariate covariances, uh, this is the formula, right? Um, and this simplifies. We show in the lecture notes. You can get this from the lecture notes. Sorry. And uh, following sometimes semi-standard convention, I'm sometimes going to omit the square bracket. So instead of writing the expected value of z, meaning the mean of z, Sometimes I just write it as easy, right, and omit, uh, omit the square brackets to simplify the notation a bit, okay? Uh, and the derivation from this step to this step is given in lecture notes. Um, and so, well, the probability density function for Gaussian looks like this. And this is one of those formulas that, I don't know, when you're implementing these algorithms, you use it over and over. But what I've seen for a lot of people is al almost no one, well, very few people start their machine learning and memorize this formula, just look it up every time you need it. I've used it so many times, I seem to have it steered in my brain by now, but most people don't. But when you use it enough, you, you, you end up memorizing it. Uh, but let me show you some pictures of what this looks like, since I think that would, um, that might be more useful. So the multivariate Gaussian density has two parameters, mu and sigma, that control the mean and the variance of this density. Okay? So this is a picture of the Gaussian density. Um, this is a two-dimensional Gaussian bump. And for now, I've set the mean parameter to zero. So mu is a two-dimensional parameter. This is a like zero, zero, which is why this Gaussian bump is uh, centered at zero. Um, and the covariance matrix sigma is the identity um, is the identity matrix. So uh, so you know well, so so you have this standard. This is also called the standard Gaussian distribution, which means mean zero and covariance equals to the identity. Now I'm going to take the covariance matrix and shrink it. Right. So take the covariance matrix and multiply it by a number less than one. That should shrink the variance, reduce the variability in distributions. If I do that, the density, um, the uh, probability density function becomes taller. Uh, this, this is a probability density function, so it always integrates to one, right? The area under the curve you know, is, is, is one, and so by reducing the covariance from the identity to 0 0.6 times the identity, it reduces the spread of the Gaussian density. Um, but it also makes it tall as a result because you know, the area under the curve must integrate to one. Now let's make it fatter. Uh, let's make the covariance two times the identity. Then you end up with a wider distribution where the values of, um, I guess, the axes here, this would be the Z1 and the Z2 axes, the two dimensions of the Gaussian density, right, increases the variance of the density. So let's go back to the standard Gaussian uh, covariance equal 1, 1. Now, let's try filling around with the off-diagonal entries. Um, I'm gonna, so right now, uh, the off-diagonal entries are 0, right? So in this Gaussian density, the off-diagonal elements are 0, 0. Let's increase that to 0 0.5 and see what happens. So if you do that, then the Gaussian density, uh, hopefully you can see the change, right? It goes from this round shape to this slightly narrower thing. Let's increase the further to 0 0.8, 0 0.8 then the density ends up looking like that, um, where now it's more likely that Z1, now uh, Z1 and Z2 are positively correlated. Okay? So let's go through all of these plots, um, but now looking at contours of these Gaussian densities instead of these 3D bumps. So uh, this is the 
contours of the Gaussian density when the covariance matrix is the identity matrix. And apologize, the aspect ratio. These are supposed to be perfectly round circles, but the aspect ratio makes this look a little bit fatter, but this is supposed to be perfectly round circles. Um, and so uh, when uh, the covariance matrix is the identity matrix, you know, Z1 and Z2 are uncorrelated, um, uh, and the contours of the Gaussian bump, of the Gaussian density, look like round circles. And if you increase the off-diagonal, excuse me, then it looks like that. If you increase it further to 0 0.8, 0 0.8, it looks like that, okay? Uh, where now, most of the probability mass, pro most probability density function places value on um, Z1 and Z2 being positively correlated. Okay. Um, next, let's look at uh, what happens if we set the off-diagonal elements to negative values, right? So um, actually, what do you think will happen? Let's set the off-diagonals to negative 0.5.5. Oh wow, people seeing people making that hand gesture. Okay, cool. Right, great. Right. So 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 you, you endow the two random variables in negative correlation. So you end up with um this type of uh probability density function, right? Uh, and in contours it looks like this. Okay? With where it's now slanted the other way. So now Z1 and Z2 have a negative correlation. And that's point A point A. Okay. All right. So so far we've been keeping the mean vector as zero and just varying the covariance matrix. Um, oh, good, yeah. Well, most of the covariance matrix is uh, Yes, every covariance matrix is symmetric, yeah. Um, yeah. Should we be thinking of a sigma matrix as like a series of column vectors at points in some interesting direction based on those contour plots? Uh, should we think of a covariance matrix as interesting column vectors that point in interesting directions? Not really. Um, let me think. Maybe we should, yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I think the covariance matrix is always symmetric, and so I would usually not look at single columns of the covariance matrix in isolation. Uh, when we talk about principal components analysis, talk about the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix, which are the principal directions in which it points. But yeah, maybe, maybe we'll get to that later. The eigenvectors at this point is like the minimum and Uh, yes, yeah. so the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix point in the principal axes of the ellipse uh, that's defined by the contours, yeah. Cool. Okay, um, so this is a standard Gaussian with mean zero. So the Gaussian bump is centered at zero, zero, because mu is zero, zero. Uh, let's move mu around. So I'm gonna move you know, mu to zero, one point, to zero, one point five, so that moves the Gaussian, uh, the position of the Gaussian density, right? Now let's move it to a different location move it to minus 1.5, minus one. And so by varying the value of mu, you could also shift the center of the Gaussian density around, okay? So hope this gives you a sense of, um, as you vary the parameters, the mean and the covariance matrix of the 2D Gaussian density, um, the source of probability, probability density functions you can get as a result of changing mu and sigma, okay? Um, any other questions about this? the screen. All right, cool. So, Here is the GDA, right, model. Um, and and uh, let's see. So um, remember, for GDA, we need to model P of X given Y, right, instead of P of Y given X. So I'm gonna write this separately in two separate equations, P of X given Y equals zero. So what's the chance What's the uh, probability density of the features if it's a benign tumor? Um, I'm gonna assume it's Gaussian. So I'm gonna write out the formula for Gaussian. Okay. 
Um, and then similarly, I'm going to assume that if is a malignant tumor, so if y is equal to one, that the density of the features is also Gaussian. Okay. And um, I want to point out a couple of things. So the parameters of the GDA model are mu zero, mu one, and sigma. Um, and for reasons we'll go into in a little bit, we use the same sigma for both classes, um, but we'll use different means, zero and one, okay? Uh, and we can come back to this later. If you want, you could use separate parameters, you know, sigma zero and sigma one, but that's not usually done. So we're gonna assume that the two Gaussians for the positive and negative classes have the same covariance matrix, but that they have different means. Uh, you don't have to make this assumption, but this is the way it's most commonly done. And we can talk about the reason why we tend to do that in a second. Um, so this is a model for P of Y given X. The other thing we need to do is model P of Y. Uh, so Y is just a Bernoulli random variable, right? It takes on you know, the value zero or one. And so I'm going to write it like this, phi to the Y times one minus phi to the one minus Y. Um, and you saw this kind of notation when we talked about logistic regression, but all this means is that, um, you know, probably of y being equal to one is equal to phi, right? Because y is either zero or one. And so um, this is the way of writing uh, uh, part of y equals one is equal to phi, okay? And uh, you saw a similar exponentiation notation when we're talking about um, logistic regression, right? Uh, one week ago, last Monday. And so the last parameter is phi. So this is Rn, this is also Rn, this is R n by n, and that's just a row number between zero and one. Okay. So, um, for any, let's see, so if you can fit mu zero, mu one, sigma, and phi to your data, then these parameters will define P of X given Y and P of Y. And so if at test time, you have a new patient walked into your office and you need to compute this, then you can compute, right, these things in the red and the orange boxes. Each of these is a number. And by plugging all these numbers in the formula, you get a number alpha P of Y equals one given X, and you can then predict, you know, malignant or benign tumor, right? So let's talk about how to fit the parameters. So you have a training set. Um, as usual, I'm gonna write the training, well, I'm gonna, let me write the training set like this. X I, Y I for I equals one through M, right? This is a usual training set. Um, and what we're going to do in order to fit these parameters is maximize the joint likelihood. And in particular, um, let me define the likelihood of the parameters. To be equal to the product from i equals one through m of p of x i y i, you know, parameterized by um, the parameters. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna drop the parameters here, right? To simplify the notation a little bit, okay? And the big difference between um, a generative learning algorithm like this compared to a discriminative learning algorithm is that the cost function you maximize is this joint likelihood, which is P of X comma Y, whereas for a discriminative learning algorithm, we were maximizing um, this other thing, right? Uh, 
uh, which is sometimes also called the conditional likelihood. So the big difference between the, these two cost functions is that for logistic regression or linear regression or generalized linear models, um, you are trying to choose parameters data that maximize P of Y given X. But for generative learning algorithms, we're gonna to try to choose parameters that maximize P of X and Y or P of X comma Y, right? Okay. So, So if you use um, maximum likelihood estimation, right. um, so you choose the parameters phi, mu zero, mu one, and sigma that maximize the log likelihood Right, where this you define as you know log of the likelihood that we define out there, um, and so uh, we, we actually ask you to do this as a problem set in the next homework. But so the way you maximize this is um, look at that formula for the likelihood, take logs, take derivatives of this thing, set the derivative equal to zero, and then solve for the values of the parameters and maximize this whole thing. And I'll, I'll just tell you the answers you're supposed to get, uh, but that, that you still have to do the derivation. Right. Um, the value of phi that maximizes this is, you know, not that surprisingly. So, so phi is the estimate of uh, probability of y being equal to one, right? So what's the chance when the next patient walks into your uh, doctor's office that they have a, a malignant tumor? And so the maximum likelihood estimate for phi is, um, it's just of all of your training examples, what's the fraction with label y equals one, right? So you know, the maximum likelihood of the uh, bias of a coin toss is just, well, count of the fraction of pairs you got, okay? So this, this is it. Um, and one other way to write this is um, sum from i equals one through m, indicator Um, let's see. So, actually, we talked about indicator notation on Wednesday. Did you? No. Uh, did you talk, did we, did we talk, did you talk about indicator notation on Wednesday? No. Okay. Oh, so, um, uh, this notation is an indicator function uh, where um, indicator yi equals 1 is uh, uh, returns 0 or 1 depending on whether the thing inside is true, right? So, there's an indicator notation in which uh, indicator of a true statement is equal to one, and indicator of a false statement is equal to zero. So that's another way of writing, writing this formula, right? Um, and then the maximum likelihood estimate for mu zero is this. Um, I'll just write out Um, and so, well, it, it, it actually, if, if you uh, put aside the math for now, what do you think is the maximum likelihood estimate of the mean of all of the uh, features for the benign tumors, right? Well, what you do is you take all the benign tumors in your training set and just take their average. That seems like a very reasonable way. Just look, look at your training set, look at, all of the, um, look at all of the benign tumors, all the O's, I guess, and then just take the mean of these, and that you know, seems like a pretty reasonable way to estimate mu zero, right? Look at all of your negative examples and average their features. So this is a way of writing out that intuition. Um, so the denominator is sum from i equals one through m indicator y i equals zero. And so the denominator will count up the number of examples that have benign tumors, right? Because every time y i equals zero, you get an extra one in this sum. Um, uh, and 
And so the denominator ends up being the total number of benign tumors in your training set. Okay? Um, and the numerator, uh, some frame equals 1, 3m indicator is a benign tumor times xi. So the effect of that is um, whenever a tumor is benign, is 1 times the features. Whenever an example is malignant, is 0 times the features. And so the numerator is summing up all the features, all the feature vectors for all of the examples that are benign. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll, I'll just write this up. So this is sum of feature vectors for, um, for all the examples with y equals 0. Right? And the denominator is a number of examples with y equals 0, okay? And then if you take this ratio, if you take this fraction, then you're summing up all of the feature vectors for the benign tumors, divide by the total number of benign tumors in the training set, and so that's just the mean of the feature vectors of all of the benign examples, okay? Um, and then, Maximum likelihood for mu one, no surprises. It's, it's sort of kind of what you'd expect. Sum up all of the positive examples and divide by the total number of positive examples and get their mean. So that's maximum likelihood for, for mu one. Um, and then I'll just write this out. If you're familiar with um, covariance matrices, this formula might not surprise you, but if you're less familiar, then I guess you can see the details in the homework. Yeah, okay. Don't worry too much about that. Uh, you can unpack the details in the lecture notes or, or in the homeworks. Okay. Um, but the covariance matrix basically tries to you know, fit contours to that ellipse like we saw. Uh, so, so try to fit a Gaussian into both of these with these corresponding means, but you want one covariance matrix to both of these, okay? Um, so these are the, so, 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 the way, so the way I motivated this was, you know, I said, well, if you want to estimate the mean of a coin toss, just count a fraction of coin tosses, the came of heads, uh, and then it seems like the mean for mu zero and mu one, you should just look at these examples and pick the mean, right? So that, that was the intuitive explanation for how you get these formulas. But the mathematically sound way to get these formulas is not via this intuitive argument that I just gave, is instead to look at the likelihood, uh, take log, get the log likelihood, take derivatives, set derivatives equal to zero, solve for all these values, and prove more formally that these are the actual values that maximize this thing, right, by, by saying there's a zero and solving. So you can see that for yourself um, in the problem sets. Okay? So, Um, finally, having fit these parameters, um, if you want to make a prediction, right, so given a new patient, uh, how do you make a prediction for whether their tumor is malignant or benign? Um, so if you want to predict the most likely class label, uh, you choose max over y of p of y given x, right? Um, and by Bayes' rule, this is max over y of p of x given y, p of y divided by p of x, okay? Now, um, I want to introduce one, well, one, one more piece of notation, which is, uh, I'm going to introduce Actually, how, how many of you are familiar with the argmax notation? Most of you. Like, okay, two, two thirds? Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll go over this quickly. So, um, let's do this an example. So, the, um, let's see. Uh, boy. All right. 
So, you know, the min over z of uh, z minus 5 squared is equal to 0, because the smallest possible value of z minus 5 squared is 0, right? And the argument over z of z minus 5 squared is equal to 5, okay? So the min is the smallest possible value attained by the thing inside, and the argument is the value you need to plug in to achieve that smallest possible value, right? So uh, the prediction you actually want to make, if you want to output a value for y, you don't want to output a probability, right? You want to say, well, what do I think is the value of y? So you want to choose the value of y that maximizes this. And so, so there's the argmax of this, and this would be either 0 or 1, right? Um, so that's equal to argmax of that. And you notice that uh, this denominator is just a constant, right? It doesn't, doesn't, it's a P of X. It's, y doesn't even appear in there. It's just some positive number. And so this is equal to just argmax over Y, P of X given Y times P of Y. Okay. So when implementing, um, uh, when, when making predictions with Gaussian discriminant and that with uh, generative learning algorithms, sometimes to save on computation, you don't bother to calculate the denominator if all you care about is to make a prediction. But if you actually need a probability, then you have to normalize the probability. Right. Okay. So, let's examine what the algorithm is doing. All right, so let's look at the same data set and uh, compare and contrast what a discriminative loading algorithm versus a generative loading algorithm will do on this data set. Right. Um, here's an example with two features, x1 and x2, and positive and negative examples. So let's start with a discriminative learning algorithm. Uh, let's say you initialize the parameters randomly. Typically, when you run logistic regression, I almost always initialize the parameters as zero, but, but this just, you know, it's just more interesting to start off for the purpose of visualization in a random line, I guess. And then if you run one iteration of gradient descent on the conditional likelihood, um, one iteration of logistic regression moves the line there. That's two iterations, three iterations, um, four iterations, and so on. And after about 20 iterations, it'll converge to that pretty decent discriminative boundary. Okay? So that's logistic regression, really searching for a line that separates positive and negative examples. How about the generative learning algorithm? What it does is the following, which is fit uh, with Gaussian discriminant analysis. What we'll do is fit Gaussians to the positive and negative examples. Right? And, and just one, one, one technical detail, um, I described this as if we look at the two classes separately because we use the same covariance matrix sigma for the positive and negative classes. We actually don't quite look at them totally separately, but we do fit two Gaussian densities to the positive and negative examples. Um, and then what we do is for each point, try to decide uh, what is this class label using Bayes rule, using that formula. And it turns out that this implies the following decision boundary, right? So points to the upper right of this decision boundary, th that straight line I just drew, you are closer to the negative class, you end up classifying them as negative examples, and points to the lower left of that line, you end up classifying as, 45, as uh, positive examples. And um, uh, I've also drawn in green here the decision boundary for logistic regression. So, so, so these two algorithms actually come up with slightly different decision boundaries, okay? But the way you arrive at these two decision boundaries are a little bit different. Okay. So, um, all right, let's go back to the, any questions about this? Yeah. Oh, sure, yes, good question. So um, why, why, why do we use two separate means, mu zero and mu one, and a single covariance matrix sigma? Um, it turns out that, um, uh, well, it, it turns out that if you choose to build the model this way, the decision boundary ends up being linear, 
And so for a lot of problems, if you want the linear boundary, uh, 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 yeah. And it turns out you could choose to use two separate um, covariance matrix, sigma zero and sigma one, and that'll actually work okay, right? That's, it's actually very reasonable to do so as well. But uh, you double the number of parameters roughly, and you end up with a decision boundary that isn't linear anymore. But it's actually not an unreasonable algorithm to do that as well. Um, now, there's one. <coughs> now, there's one very interesting property um, about Gaussian discriminant analysis. And it turns out that, uh, well, let's, let's, let's compare. GDA to a logistic regression. And um, for a fixed set of parameters, So let's say you've learned some set of parameters. Um, I'm going to do an exercise where we're going to plot p of y equals 1 given x, you know, parameterized by all these things, right, as a function of x. Um, so I'm, I'm going to do this little exercise in a second. But what this means is, um, well, this formula, this is equal to P of x given y equals 1, you know, which is parameterized by, right, well, the various parameters times P of y equals 1, which is parameterized by phi, divided by P of x, which depends on all the parameters, I guess. So uh, by Bayes rule, you know this formula is equal to this little thing, and uh, just as we saw earlier, I guess right. Once you have fixed all the parameters, that's just a number you compute by evaluating the Gaussian density. Um, this is a Bernoulli probability. So actually, p of y equals one parameterized by phi. This is just equal to phi is that second term, and you similarly calculate the denominator. But so for every value of x. You can compute this ratio and thus get a number for the chance of y being equal to 1 given x. Okay. So I'm going to go through one example of uh, what function you get for p of y equals 1 given x, for what function you get for this if you actually plot this for um, different values of x. Okay. So, um, Let's see. Let's say you have uh, just one feature, x. So x is a, um, you know, uh, uh, and let's say that you have a few negative examples there and a few positive examples there. Right, so it's a simple data set. Okay. And let's see what Gaussian discrete analysis will do on this data set. Um, with just one feature, so that's why all the data is possible on 1D. So, let me map all this data to an x-axis. I just took this data and mapped it down. And um, if you fit a Gaussian to each of these two data sets, then you end up with, you know, Gaussians as follows, where this bump on the left is P of x, given y equals 0, and this bump on the right is p of x given y equals 1, right? And, and again, there's a technical detail that we set the same variance to the two Gaussians, but you, know, you kind of model the Gaussian densities of what does class 0 look like, what does class 1 look like with two Gaussian bumps like this. Oh, and then because the data set is split 50-50, you know, p of y equals 1 is 0 0.5, right? So one half prior. 
Now, let's go through that exercise I described on the left of trying to plot p of y equals 1 given x for different values of x. Oh, so the vertical axis here is p of y equals 1 given different values of x. So um, let's pick a point far to the left here. Right? With this model, you, if, if you actually calculate this ratio, you find that um, if you have a point here, it almost certainly came from this Gaussian on the left. Right? If, if, a, if you have an unlabeled example here, you almost certainly came from the uh, class zero Gaussian because the chance of this Gaussian generating example all the way to the left is almost zero. Right? And so chance of p, p of y equals one given x is very small. So for a point like that, you end up with a point you know, very close to zero. Right? Um, let's pick another point. All right, how about this point, the midpoint? Well, if you get an example right in the midpoint, you're, you really have no idea. You really can't tell. Did this come from the negative or the positive Gaussian? Can't tell, right? So this is really 50-50. So I guess if this is a 0.5, for that midpoint, you would have p of y equals 1 given x is 0.5. Um, and then if you go to a point way to the right, if you get an example way here, then you'd be pretty sure this came from the positive examples. And so, you know, you get a point like that. Now, it turns out that if you repeat this exercise, uh, sweeping from left to right for many, many points on the x-axis, you find that for points far to the left, the chance of this coming from uh, the y equals 1 class is very small. And as you approach this midpoint, it increases to 0.5 and it surpasses 0.5. And then beyond a certain point, it becomes very, very close to 1. Right? And you do this exercise and actually just for every point, you know, for a dense grid on the x-axis, evaluate this formula, which will give you a number between 0 and 1, this is a probability, and go ahead and plot you know, the values, you get a curve like this. And it turns out that if you connect up the dots, um, then this is exactly a sigmoid function. The shape of that turns out to be exactly a shape sigmoid function, and you prove this in the problem sets as well. Um, so, um, both logistic regression and Gaussian discriminant analysis actually end up using a sigmoid function to calculate, you know, p of y equals one given x. Or, 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 or the, the, the outcome ends up being a sigmoid function. I guess the mechanics is you actually use this calculation rather than compute a sigmoid function. But um, the specific choice of the parameters they end up choosing are quite different. And you saw when I was projecting the results on the display just now in PowerPoint uh, that the two algorithms actually come up with two different decision boundaries. So um, let's discuss when a generative algorithm like GDA is superior and when a discriminative algorithm like logistic regression is superior. Um, Let's see. Let me make board space and do this. All right. So GDA, Gaussian discriminant analysis, so the generative approach. This assumes that x given y equals zero, this is Gaussian with mean mu zero and covariance sigma. It assumes x given y equals one, this is Gaussian with mean mu one and covariance sigma, and y is Bernoulli with um, uh, parameter spy. Right? And what logistic regression does This is a discriminative algorithm. Oh, oh this is some strange wind at the back, is it? Awesome. Okay, cool. All right. Yeah. Boy. No, there's th th just a scary UN report on global warming over the weekend. I hope we don't already have storms here. Uh, okay, it's okay. 
Did you guys see the UN report? On, uh, it's, it's sli slightly scary, actually, what the, the, the UN report on global warming, but hopefully, all right, good. Hurricane stopped. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, so what logistic regression assumes is P of Y equals one given X. You know, that this is uh, governed by a logistic function, right? So this is, you know, one over one plus e to negative theta transpose x. With, with some details about x zero equals one, and so on, right? So just, just, okay. So, so in other words, uh, it's assumed that this is um, p of y equals one given x is logistic. Okay? And the argument that I just described just now, uh, plotting, you know, p of y equals one given x point by point, so really the sigmoid curve I drew on the other board. What that illustrates, um, it, it doesn't prove it. You prove it yourself in a homework problem. Uh, but what that illustrates is that this set of assumptions implies that p of y equals one given x is governed by a logistic function, right? But it turns out that the implication in the opposite direction is not true. Right? So if you assume P of Y equals one given X is governed by a logistic function, by, by this shape, this does not in any way, shape, or form assume that X given Y is Gaussian, uh, uh, X given Y equals zero is Gaussian, X given Y one is Gaussian. Right? So what this means is that GDA the generative learning algorithm in this case, this makes a stronger set of assumptions. And which is regression makes a weaker set of assumptions because you can prove these assumptions from these assumptions. Okay. Um, and by the way, as as uh, as as a uh, Let's see. And so what you see in a lot of learning algorithms is that um, if you make stronger modeling assumptions, and if your modeling assumptions are roughly correct, then your model will do better because you're telling more information to the algorithm. So if indeed x given y is Gaussian, then GDA will do better because you're telling the algorithm x given y is Gaussian, and so it can be more efficient. And so even if you have a very small data set, um, if these assumptions are roughly correct, then GDA will do better. And the problem with GDA is if these assumptions turn out to be wrong. So if X given Y is not at all Gaussian, then this might be a very bad set of assumptions to make. You might be trying to fit a Gaussian density to data that is not at all Gaussian, and then GDA would do more poorly. Okay. So here's one fun fact. Here's another example. I'll get to the question in a second. Which is... Um, Let's say the following are true. Let's say that x given y equals one is Poisson with a parameter lambda one, and x given y equals zero is Poisson with a mean uh, lambda zero, or lambda one, lambda zero, and y as before is Bernoulli five, right? It turns out that this set of assumptions also imply that p of y equals one given x is logistic, okay? And you can prove this. And this is actually true for um, any generalized linear model, actually, where, uh, where, where uh, the difference between these two distributions varies only according to the natural parameter of the generalized linear, uh, uh, excuse me, of the exponential family distribution, right? And so what this means is that um, if you don't know if your data is Gaussian or Poisson, um, if you're using logistic regression, you don't need to worry about it. It'll work fine either way, right? So, so you know, maybe um, you're know, fitting data to, maybe you're fitting a, a, a model, random classification mo model to some data, and you don't know, is the data Gaussian, is it Poisson, is it some other exponential family model? Maybe you just don't know. But if you're fitting logistic regression, it'll, it'll, it'll do fine under all of those scenarios. But if your data was actually Poisson, but you assumed it was Gaussian, then your model might do quite poorly. Okay? So the key high-level principles we're going to take away from this is um, uh, 
uh, if you make weaker assumptions, as in logistic regression, then your algorithm will be more robust to modeling assumptions, such as accidentally assuming the data is Gaussian if it's not. Uh, but on the flip side, if you have a very small data set, then um, using a model that makes more assumptions will actually allow you to do better because by making more assumptions, you're just telling the algorithm more truth about the world, which is, you know, hey, algorithm, the world is Gaussian. And if it is Gaussian, then it will actually do, do, do better. Okay, we have a quick question at the back or a few questions? Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, practice sample, what sort of data is a Gaussian property? You know, it's, uh, uh, yeah, you know, it's a matter of degree, right? Most data on this universe is Gaussian, uh, 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 except for the speed data, I guess, yeah. But, but um, so I think it's actually a, a matter of degree, right? If, if you plot, actually, if you take continuous value data, no, there, no there, there are exceptions. You could plot it, and most data that you plot, you know, will not really be Gaussian, but a lot of it you can convince yourself is vaguely Gaussian. So I think a lot of it is a matter of degree. I, I actually tell you the way I choose to use um, these two algorithms. So I think that the whole world has moved toward using bigger and bigger data sets, right? Digital data society, which is a lot of data. And so for a lot of problems where you have a lot of data, I would probably use logistic regression because with more data, you can overcome telling the algorithm less about the world. So, so the algorithm has two sources of knowledge. Uh, one source of knowledge is what did you tell it, what are the assumptions you told it to make. And the second source of knowledge is learn from the data. And in this era of big data, we have a lot of data, you know, there is a strong trend to use logistic regression, which makes less assumptions and just lets the algorithm figure out whatever it wants to figure out from the data. Right? Now, one practical reason why I still use algorithms like uh, GDA, general discriminant analysis, or algorithms like this, um, uh, is that it's actually quite computationally efficient. And so th there's actually one use case at Landing AI that I'm working on where we just need to fit a ton of models and don't have the patience to run logistic regression over and over. And it turns out computing mean invariances of um, covariance matrices is very efficient. And so this is actually, apart from the assumptions type of benefit, uh, which is a general philosophical point we'll see again later in this course, right? This idea about do you make strong or weak assumptions, this is a general principle in machine learning that we'll see again in other places. But as a very concrete, the other reason I tend to use GDA these days is less that I think it perform better from an accuracy point of view, but there's actually a very efficient algorithm. You just compute the mean covariance and then you're done and there's no iterative process needed. So these days, when I use these models, um, it's more, motivated by computation and less by performance. But this general principle is one that we'll come back to again later when we develop more sophisticated learning algorithms. Yeah. Uh, if the data is generated from a Gaussian, but the covariance matrices are different, does the assumption that we just use the same covariance for performance make sense? Oh, right. Uh, so what happens if the covariance matrices are different? It turns out that uh, uh, it still ends up being a logistic function, but with a bunch of quadratic terms in a logistic function, so it's not a linear decision boundary anymore. You can end up with a decision boundary, you know, that 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 looks like this, right? With positive and negative examples separated by some by some other shape, right? With linear decision boundary. Uh, you you could you could you could think, actually, I, if you're curious, I encourage you to you know uh, uh, fire up Python NumPy and and play around with parameters and plot this for yourself. Uh, next question. Yeah, is it recommended to do some statistical tests to see if it's Gaussian? Um, I can tell you what's done in practice. I think in practice, if you have enough data to do a statistical test and gain conviction, you probably have enough data to just use logistic regression. Um, uh, the, the, I, I, I don't know. Well, no, that's not really fair. I don't know. If you're very high dimensional data, I, I think what often happens more is people just plot the data. And if it looks clearly non-Gaussian, then you know, that would be a reason to not use GDA. But what happens often is that um, uh, uh, sometimes you just have a very small training set and it's just a matter of judgment, right? Like if you have, if you have a, 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 you know, I don't know, 50 examples of healthcare records, then you just have to ask some doctors and ask, well, do you think the distribution is relatively Gaussian and use domain knowledge like that. Right. I think, by the way, another philosophical point, um, I think that uh, 
the machine learning world has frankly you know, a little bit overhyped big data, right? And, and yes, it's true that when you have more data, it's great. And I love data and all, having more data pretty much never hurts. And usually the more data, the better. So all that is true. And I think we did a good job telling people that high level message, you know, more data almost always helps. But um, uh, I think a lot of the skill in machine learning these days is getting your algorithms to work even when you don't have a million examples, even when you don't have a hundred million examples. So there are lots of machine learning applications where you just don't have a million examples, uh, you have a hundred examples, and um, it's then the skill in designing the learning algorithm matters much more. Um, so if you take something like ImageNet, a million in, in images, there are now dozens of teams, maybe hundreds of teams, I don't know. They can get great results if you have a million examples, right? And so the performance difference between teams, you know, there are now <coughs> dozens of teams that get great performance if you have a million examples uh, for, for, for image classification like ImageNet. But if you have only 100 examples, then the high skill teams will actually do much, 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 much better than the low skill teams, whereas the performance gap is smaller when you have giant data sets, I think. So, and I think that is these types of intuitions, you know, what assumptions to use, generative or discriminative, that actually distinguishes the high skill teams and the, and, the, and the less experienced teams and drives a lot of performance differences when you have small data. Oh, and if someone goes to you and says, oh, you only have 100 examples, you never do anything, then I don't know, if, if it's a competitor saying that, then I'll say, great, you know, don't do it, because I can make it work. Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, but, but I think there are a lot of applications where your skill at designing a machine learning system really makes a bigger difference when you have a, make, makes a it makes a difference for big data and small data, but it just is it's very clear when you don't have much data, it's the assumptions you code into the algorithm, like is it Gaussian, is it Poisson, that, that skill allows you to drive much bigger performance than a lower skill team would be able to. All right, let's just, uh, uh, let's just take questions from other people. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sure, so does this, uh, yeah, so what's the general statement of this? Yes, so if uh, x given y equals one uh, comes from an exponential family distribution, x given y equals zero comes from an exponential family distribution, the same exponential family distribution, and if they vary only by the natural parameter of exponential family distribution, then this will be logistic, yeah. Um, I think this was once a midterm homework problem to prove this, actually, but yeah. All right, uh, actually, let's take one last question and we'll move on, go ahead. Oh, uh, does performance improvement hold even as you increase the number of classes? Uh, yeah, I think so, yes. Uh, and the generalization of this would be the softmax regression, which I didn't talk about, but yes. I think a similar thing holds true for um, GDF for multiple. And we have, so far, we've only talked about binary classification, whether we have more than two classes. But, uh, but yes, similar, similar things holds true for uh, like a GDF with three classes in softmax. Oh yes, right, you saw softmax the other day. Right, cool. Um, and this, this theme that when you have less data, the algorithm needs to rely more on assumptions you code in. This is a recurring theme that we'll come back to as well. This is one of the important principles of machine learning, that when you have less data, your skill at coding in your knowledge matters much more. Uh, this is a theme we'll come back to when we talk about much more complicated learning algorithms as well. All right, so oh, I want a fresh board for this. So you see GDA in the context of um, continuous valued uh, features X. The last thing I want to do today um, is talk about one more generative learning algorithm called naive base. Um, and I'm going to use as a motivating example email spam classification, but this, this is, this, I guess this is our first foray into natural language processing, right? But given a piece of text, like given a piece of email, can you classify this as spam or not spam? Or uh, other examples, uh, uh, actually several years ago, eBay used a problem of, you know, if uh, someone's trying to sell something and you write a text description, right? Hey, I have a secondhand, you know, Roomba, I'm trying to sell it on eBay. How do you take that text that someone wrote of a description and categorize it? Is it an electronic thing or are they trying to sell a TV? Are they trying to sell clothing? 
uh, but these, these examples are text classification problems. We have a piece of text and you want to classify it into one of two categories for spam or non-spam or one of maybe thousands of categories. If you're trying to take a product description and classify it into one of the classes. Um, and so the first question we will have is um, uh, given an email problem, uh, given an email classification problem, how do you represent it as a feature vector? And so um, in naive ways, what we're going to do is take your email, take a piece of email, and first map it to a feature vector x. And we'll do so as follows, which is first, um, let's start with a, let's start with the English dictionary and make a list of all the words in the English dictionary. Right? So first word in the English dictionary is a, second word in the English dictionary is advoc, Third word is odd wolf. Uh, that's easy. Look it up. <laughs> um, and then you know, uh, uh, email spam. A lot of people ask you to buy stuff, so the word buy, right? And then, um, uh, and then the last word in my dictionary is zigmergy, which is the technological chemistry that refers to the fermentation process in brewing. Um, so, so again, this is a useful way to think about it. In, in, in practice, what you do is not uh, uh, actually look at the dictionary, but look at the top 10,000 words in a, in a training set. Right? But so maybe you have 10,000. It's easier to think about it as if it was a dictionary, but you know, in practice, what you, the other thing that's, dictionary has too many words, but what, the other way to do it is to look through your own email corpus and just find the top 10,000 occurring words and use that as a feature set. And so, I don't know. Right, in your emails, I guess you're getting a bunch of email about from us or maybe others about CS229. So CS229 might appear in your dictionary of building an email spam filter for yourself, even if it doesn't appear in the in the official, uh, was it like the Oxford dictionary? Just yet, just 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 you wait. We'll, we'll, we'll get CS229 there someday. All right, um, and so given an email, what we would like to do is then um, take this piece of text and represent it as feature vector. And so one way to do this is um, you can create a binary feature vector that puts a one if a word appears in an email and puts a zero if it doesn't, right? So if you get an email um, uh, that asks you to you know, buy some stuff and if the word A appears in the email, you put a one there. They're not trying to sell Advoc or Art Wolf, so zero there, buy, and so on, right? So you take, a, take an email and turn it into a binary feature vector. Um, and so here, the feature vector is 0, 1 to the n, because it's an n-dimensional binary feature vector, where, where for the purpose of illustration, let's say n is 10,000, because you're using, you know, take the top 10,000 words uh, that appear in your email training set as the dictionary that you will use. So, um, so in other words, xi is indicator word i appears in the email, right? So it's either zero or one, depending on whether or not that word i from this list appears in your email. Now, um, in the naive Bayes algorithm, we're going to build a generative learning algorithm. Um, and so we want to model P of X given Y, right? Uh, as well as P of Y, okay? But there are uh, two to the 10,000 possible values of x, right? Because x is a binary vector of this 10,000 dimensional. So if we try to model p of x in the straightforward way as a multinomial distribution over, you know, two to the 10,000 possible outcomes, then you need, right, uh, uh, you need, you know, two to the 10,000 parameters, right? Which is a lot. Uh, or actually, technically, you need two to the 10,000 minus one parameters because that add up to one, so you save one parameter. 
Um, but so modeling this without additional assumptions won't, won't work, right? Because uh, it's ex excessive number of parameters. So in the naive Bayes algorithm, we're going to assume that the xi's are uh, conditionally independent given y. Okay? Uh, let me just write out what this means. But so p of x1 up to x10,000 given y, by the chain rule of probability, this is equal to p of x1 given y times p of x2 given um, x1 and y times p of x3 given x1, x2, y up to you know, p of x10,000 given and so on. So I haven't made any assumptions yet. This is just a true statement of fact. It's always true by the, by the chain rule of probability. Um, and what we're going to assume, which is what this assumption is, is that this is equal to this first term, no change, but x2 given y, p of x3 given y times dot 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 p of x, 10,000 given y, okay? So um, this assumption is called a conditional independence assumption. It's also sometimes called the naive Bayes assumption. But you're assuming that um, so long as you know y, the chance of seeing the word um, ad vac in your email does not depend on whether the word a appears in your email, right? Um, and this is one of those assumptions. It's definitely not a true assumption in that this is just not a mathematically true assumption. Just that sometimes your data isn't perfectly Gaussian, but if you assume it's Gaussian, you can kind of get away with it. Uh, so this assumption is not true um, in a mathematical sense, but it may be not so horrible that you can't get away with it, right? Um, and so, uh, side, side, side. If, you, if any of you are familiar with probabilistic graphical models, if you've taken CS228, uh, this assumption is summarized in this picture. And if you haven't taken CS228, this picture won't make sense, but don't worry about it. Um, right, that uh, once you know the class label, is it spam or not spam, whether or not each word appears or does not appear is independent, okay? So this is called conditional. So the, the mechanics of this assumption is really just captured by this equation. Um, uh, and you just use this equation, that's all you need to derive naive Bayes. But the intuition is that if I tell you whether this piece, if I tell you that this piece of email is spam, then whether the word buy appears in it doesn't affect your beliefs of what, whether the word mortgage or discount or whatever spammy words appear, right? So just to summarize, this is product from i equals one through n of p of x i given y. So the parameters of this model uh, are, I'm going to write phi subscript um, j given y equals 1 as the probability that xj equals 1 given y equals 1, phi subscript j given y equals 0. Then um, phi, right. and just to distinguish all these phi's from each other, I'm going to just call this phi subscript y. Okay. So this parameter says if it's spam email, if y equals one is spam, y is zero is non-spam. If it's spam email, what's the chance of word j appearing in the email? Uh, if it's not spam email, what's the chance of word j appearing in the email? Um, and then also, what's the class prior? What's the prior probability that the next email you receive in your 
uh, in, your, in your inbox is spam email. And so, um, to fit the parameters of this model, you would, similar to Gaussian discriminant analysis, write out the joint likelihood. So the joint likelihood of these parameters right, is the product you know, given these parameters. Right, similar to what we had for Gaussian discriminant analysis. And the maximum likelihood estimates um, if you take this, take logs, take derivatives, set derivatives to zero, solve for the values and maximize this, you find that the uh, maximum likelihood estimates of the parameters are phi y is pretty much what you'd expect. Right? It's just a fraction of spam emails. And uh, phi of j given y equals 1 is, um, well, I'll write this out in indicator function notation. So that's the indicator function notation of writing out, look through your uh, training set, find all the spam emails, and of all the spam emails, i.e. examples of y equals one, count up what fraction of them had word j in it. Right? So your estimate of the chance of word j appearing, in a, your, your estimate of the chance of the word by appearing in spam email is just, well, of all the spam emails in your training set, what fraction of them contained the word by? What, what fraction of them had you know, xj equals one? for say the word by, okay? Um, and so it turns out that if you implement this algorithm, it will, it will nearly work, I guess. Uh, uh, but this is naive base for, um, for email spam classification, right? And I'll mention the one reason this, uh, and it turns out that with, with one fix to this algorithm, which we'll talk about on Wednesday, um, this is actually, is actually a not too horrible spam classifier. It turns out that if you use logistic regression uh, for spam classification, you do better than this almost all the time. But this is a very efficient algorithm because estimating these parameters is just counting, and then computing probabilities is just multiplying a bunch of numbers. So there's nothing iterative about this. So you can fit this model very efficiently and also keep on updating this model even as you get new data, even as you get new, new, new you know, users hit mark a spam or whatever. Even as you get new data, you can update this model very efficiently. Um, but it turns out that, uh, actually, the, the, the biggest problem with this algorithm is what happens if uh, this is zero over, uh, if, if, uh, if you get zeros in some of these equations, right? But we'll, we'll come back to that when we talk about Laplace moving on Wednesday. Okay. All right. Any quick questions before we wrap up? No? Okay. Good. So now you learn about generative learning algorithms. Uh, we'll come back on Wednesday and learn about some more fine details of how to make this work even better. So let's break, we'll see you on Wednesday.